Hello everyone. Thank you for having me and special thanks to Mr. Chairman. Today we are diving into the world of an electrocardiogram. We'll explore how from the smallest cell humans have worked to understand and document the heart's electrical activity. So without further ado, let's begin our journey. Our agenda will unfold in three parts. Firstly, we will embark on a journey through history of ECG exploring its development. Secondly, we will delve into the foundations of ECG interpretation. Thirdly, we will engage in a practical example illustrating the interpretation of normal ECG. First, what is an ECG? An ECG is a graphical recording of the electrical activity of the heart. Let's begin by examining a myocardial cell at rest. In this state, the cell is entirely relaxed. Simultaneously, it is completely polarized, with the inner part of the cell is relatively negative compared to the outer part. A potential difference of minus 90 millivolts can be recorded across the cell membrane. The cell is in a state of readiness for stimulus that would trigger contraction. Upon arrival of the stimulus, the cell loses its state of polarization, depolarizes and even reverse polarity, resulting in recording positive 20 millivolts in its inner part in relation to the outer part. Subsequently, the cell returns to its polarized state ready for the next cycle. When looking at a group of myocardial cells, we observe a consistent pattern of behavior. Depolarization occurs sequentially in individual cells, spreading along the group. Consequently, different cells exhibit various stages of depolarization. That will result into a subtle potential differences across the group in certain direction. The same process occurs during repolarization, but the potential difference is in the opposite direction. If a galvanometer is employed across this group of cells, we can record the minor potential differences in one direction during depolarization and in the opposite direction during repolarization. This forms the core concept of ECG recording, capturing potential differences between different parts of the heart during both depolarization and repolarization. However, the heart is not merely a group of cells, it functions as a bump. Like any bump, it requires an electrical component to control its mechanical part, ensuring the necessary synchronization for optimal mechanical efficacy and adaptation to varying workloads. The electrical impulse originates in the SA node, spreading through the atria, it encounters a delay in the AV node before swiftly traveling through the superhighway of the bundle of his and bundle branches. This process ensures rapid and uniform delivery of stimulating electrical impulse, achieving maximum synchronization and timely sequential contraction of different functional parts of the heart. How it all began? According to the documented history, in 1786, Luigi Galvani, an Italian physician and physicist at the University of Bologna, discovered the association between muscle contraction and electrical activity. He demonstrated that electrical stimulation should induce muscle contraction. In 1842, Carlo Mattiucci, an Italian physicist at the University of Pisa, recorded the first electrocardiogram from a frog's heart he used the frog galvanoscope invented by Galvani earlier. 35 years later, in St. Mary Medical School in London, Augustus Willer recorded the first human cardiac electrical activity using capillary electrometer. In 1895, inspired by the work of Willer, German uh, physician Wilhelm Enthoven made significant advancements. He enhanced the capillary electrometer 
and devised a four-wave curve and named them A, B, C, and D. Later, after applying mathematical corrections for the inertia of the capillary electrometer, he introduced the now familiar five-wave ECG form, the PQRST. Einthoven named the waves using the letters that come after A, B, C, D, which are P, Q, R, S, and T, aligning with the Descartian system tradition for naming points in a curve. The first clinical ECG machine developed by Einthoven utilized a string galvanometer technology weighing more than 250 kilograms. The machine required the efforts of five individuals to operate and had to be cooled by water. Remarkably, it could detect the voltage as low as tenth of a thousandth of a simple 1.5 volt AA battery. Patients were required to immerse their arms and feet in paths during the procedure. Einthoven groundbreaking work earned him the Nobel Prize for the invention of ECG in 1924. During that period, the ECG comprised three leads. Lead 1, positioned between the left and right arms. Lead 2, situated between the right arm and left leg. Lead 3, established between the left arm and the left leg. This three-lead ECG configuration persisted for approximately 30 years. It was largely utilized for diagnosing myocardial infarction. However, Physicians observed limitations in diagnosing certain types of MI because of the three-lead system didn't capture areas crucial for the diagnosis. Consequently, there arose a necessity for additional ECG leads. In 1934, Frank Norman Wilson, based at the University of Michigan in the United States, introduced a significant innovation known as the central terminal and unipolar recording. He achieved this by connecting the three points of the Enthoven's triangle with the 5 kilo ohms resistors to create the negative pool of his terminal. The positive pool or the exploring electrode was utilized to record local potentials, which later evolved into the unipolar pericardial leads. In 1938, the American Heart Association and the Cardiac Society of Great Britain jointly published recommendations for recording the exploring leads from six sites, designated as V1 through V6, positioned across the pericardium. In 1942, Dr. Emanuel Goldberger from the Lincoln Hospital in New York attempted to utilize the Wilson Central Terminal for recording additional limb leads. However, he encountered small signals. To address this, he conceived the idea of augmenting the limb leads by connecting the negative pools of his recording electrodes to the opposite limbs using 5 kilo ohms resistors. This augmentation process resulting into 50% increase in signal st strength leading to the introduction of augmented foot lead, augmented left lead, and augmented right lead. This innovation effectively expanded the number of limb leads from 3 to 6. Eventually, in 1954, the American Heart Association published their recommendations for standardization of 12-lead electrocardiogram as we know it right now. Utilizing the 12 leads allows us to examine the electrical activity of the heart from two different perspectives, six in the frontal plane and six in the horizontal plane. Leads 1 and AVL provides a high lateral perspective of the heart, while leads V5 and V6 offers a lateral view. Leads 2, 3 and AVF offers inferior perspective. V1 and V2 focuses on the interventricular septum. V3 and V4 concentrates on the anterior wall of the heart. 
There are distinctive features in the normal 12 leads recording for a specific lead such as 1. In lead AVR, all the waves are inverted. The P wave in V1 is biphasic. In the pericardial leads, the R wave of the QRS complex progressively increases in amplitude from V1 to V6. Similarly, the pericardial leads S wave gradually diminishes from V1 to V5. To have a clean, accurate ECG recording, you should take care of your ECG recorder and follow certain steps during recording. First, you should do good skin preparation to reduce the resistance of the skin. Identify the leads, place limb leads, place chest leads, then use conductive gel, and instruct the patient not to move and relax, check the calibration and paper speed, note artifacts and bleed misplacements. After you finish, clean your leads, which is very important because dry gel is an insulator. Store your machine properly, taking care not to tangle the wires. ECG interpretation is simplified in eight steps. Step one is calibration, time, date, and patient data. ECG calibration is crucial for accurate interpretation of amplitude. Proper calibration, whether done manually or automatically, should be insisted upon. Paper speed is an essential factor for ensuring precise time measurement. Adjustments in paper speed should be applied judiciously when necessary. ECG is a highly dynamic tool, and annotating the date and time is vital for establishing the chronological order of events. This chronological sequence is of an utmost importance in clinical assessment. Patient identification is a fundamental requirement in all medical documents, and ECG is no exception. Taking note of accompanying symptomatology during the recording may be essential. Most ECG recording media is sensitive to thermal variations, necessitating careful handling and storage. Consideration for more durable media, such as digital formats, is indispensable. Understanding an ECG, which is essentially a graph drawn on a graph paper, involves recognizing the significance of horizontal and vertical markings. Horizontal markings, which serve to identify and measure time, with the standard paper speed at 25 mm per second. Each small square corresponds to 40 milliseconds, meaning that 1000 milliseconds divided by 25. Therefore, a big square encompasses 200 milliseconds. Any variations in the standard speed should be duly noted. Vertical markings represent voltage. The machine typically draws a calibration mark covering 10 small squares. The calibration mark's value is 1 millivolt, making each small square equivalent to 0.1 millivolt or 100 microvolts. The second step in ECG interpretation involves determination of the rhythm and rate. Rhythm can manifest as regular or irregular, and the rate can be measured through one of three methods. For regular rhythms, two rules can be applied. The 300 rule, which involves dividing, dividing 300 by the number of big squares between consecutive events, and the more precise 1500 rule, which entails dividing 1500 by the number of small squares between consecutive events. In the case of irregular rhythms, the six second rule is applied by counting the number of irregular events occurring in 30 big squares, providing the rate in six seconds. To express the rate in events per minute, one should multiply the count by 10. It is important to note that these rules only apply if the paper speed is set at 25 mm per second. The third step to evaluate 
the atrial activity in the form of the P wave. First, ask yourself, is the P wave present? And if it is not, where might be it concealed? Are the P waves similar? Examine the relationship between the P wave and the QRS complexes. Determine the P wave axis, which should be upright in the leftward and inferior leads and inverted in AVR. Assess the duration of the P wave, which shouldn't be more than 120 milliseconds, and evaluate the amplitude of the P wave, which shouldn't be more than quarter of a millivolt. The fourth step, determine the duration of the PR interval by counting the number of small squares from the onset of the P wave to the initiation of the QRS complex. This duration shouldn't exceed 200 milliseconds and should not be less than 120 milliseconds. Step 5. Take note of the QRS complex morphology in each lead. Assess if they appear uniform. Describe and measure the duration of each morphology. If any variation exists, always consider the widest QRS measured among different leads. The duration of the QRS complex ideally shouldn't exceed 100 milliseconds. One of the crucial factors in maintaining a narrow QRS complex, indicating simultaneous ventricular depolarization, is the specialized conducting system within the ventricle. This system encompasses the bundle of his, the right bundle branch, the left bundle branch, which, are, which is furtherly divided into the left anterior fascicle and the left posterior fascicle. Any pathology affecting any segment of this system can lead to the loss of synchronized cardiac depolarization, potentially reducing the mechanical efficacy of the heart. Here, we will identify the right bundle branch and left bundle branch in ECG. In the scenario of right bundle branch block, the sequence of electrical stimulation is initiated normally across the interventricular septum and the left ventricle. As a result, the initial 80 milliseconds resembles a regular QRS complex. However, the activation of the right ventricle is delayed. Taking a left to right direction, this delay manifests as a wide delayed R wave in lead V1 and a wide S wave in V6 and lead 1. Consequently, the QRS duration increase to 120 milliseconds and beyond. In the context of left bundle branch block, the conduction in the right bundle and ventricle initiates normally. However, due to the relatively small contribution of the right ventricle in the QRS complex, it is not presented. What we can see is an abnormal right to left activation of the septum. This result into QS pattern in V1 or, significantly re or significant reduction in the R wave, compensated by a wide delayed S wave. In the left leads, such as lead 1, AVL, V5, and V6, the typical S wave disappears. The activation of the rest of the left ventricle proceeds from right to left as usual, but in slow slurred wave presented as a wide deep S wave in the right leads and a tall wide R wave in the left leads. The QRS duration typically is wider than 120 milliseconds. After measuring QRS width, shift your focus to QRS morphology, paying attention to the following points. 1. The Q waves. While normal in certain leads, it is crucial that their width doesn't exceed 30 milliseconds. Abnormalities may be arise if the Q waves are observed in other leads, such as V1 through V3. On the other hand, Q waves can present without restrictions in lead 3 and AVR. We'll proceed to the next couple of slides, slides to delve into the QRS axis and QRS amplitude. 
Here we show the hexaaxial reference system of the frontal plane, showing the different ranges of mean frontal axis of the heart. The normal axis ranges from minus 30 degree to plus 90 degree. Left axis from minus 30 degree to minus 90 degrees. Right axis from plus 90 degrees to 180 degrees. And finally, the extreme or no man axis between 180 and minus 90 degrees. So, simple rules to determine the frontal axis. Usually the axis is towards the tallest R as we can see here in panel P. If we have two waves of an equal amplitude, the axis lies usually at the middle between them, like what we see here in panel A. Also, if we have a biphasic QRS complex, usually the axis will be perpendicular to, this, uh, uh, to the axis of this QRS uh, towards the positive lead. Following QRS duration, Q waves, and QRS axis, you should check the QRS amplitude. Here we are going to address the ventricular hypertrophy. In this slide, we have a normal ECG at the left side and an ECG with right ventricular hypertrophy in the right side. Notably, there is a prominent R wave in lead V1 and deep S wave in lead 1 V5 and V6. To diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy, the Soclo line criteria are employed. If the sum of amplitudes of the R wave in V1 and the S wave in either lead 1, V5, or V6 exceeds 1.1 millivolt, which is 11 small squares, it confers the presence of right ventricular hypertrophy. In this slide, we have a normal ECG at the left side and an ECG with left ventricular hypertrophy in the right side. Notably, there is a deep S wave in lead V1 and a prominent R wave in lead 1, V5 and V6. To diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy, the Soclo line criteria are employed. If the sum of amplitudes of the S wave in V1 and R wave in either lead V5 or V6 exceeds 3.5 millivolt, it confirms the presence of LVH. Also, if the amplitude of the R wave in either V5 or V6 exceeds 2.6 millivolts, it also confirms the diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy. The sixth step is evaluation of the T waves. In the following, observations are uh, pertinent. A normal T wave axis typically looks like a normal P wave axis, being upright on all leads except in AVR, and in V1 it may be biphasic with a wide range of variability influenced by age and gender. Any deviations from the expected upright appearance in most leads, particularly abnormal peaking or T wave inversion, should be duly noted. The seventh step is examining the QT interval. It is a crucial indicator for ventricular depolarization and repolarization duration. This interval commences from the start of the QRS complex and extends until the end of the T wave, deter determined using the tangential line method. Given the variations of the QT interval with the heart rate, Correction is imperative before effectively interpreting its results. Several formulas are employed for this correction, with the PASIT formula being the most well-known and straightforward. For extremes in heart rate, the most accurate is the Hodge's formula. A corrected QT interval less than 440 milliseconds and more than 360 milliseconds is considered normal. The methods of cal calculation will be demonstrated in an upcoming example. Step 8 includes evaluation of other components, including ST segment, which should be normally at the level of the TP segment, and other waves such as the U wave. 
Changes in T wave axis and ST segment deviations are a, a, a definite marker for ischemic heart disease, among other things. But the most important feature of ischemic causes is that the regional distribution of the changes, which resemble and follow the coronary artery distribution. In the current slide, we will correlate between the uh, culprit coronary artery lesion and the lead which reflects the changes. First, we'll start with the uh, proximal LAD lesions. If we have a proximal LAD lesion, there will be usually an ST segment elevation, mostly in V2, V3, which may extend to V1 or V4, lead 1 and AVL, and with an ST segment depression in AVF and lead 3. If we have a main diagonal occluded, so usually there will be an ST segment depression in lead 3 and EVF. Sometimes there is an ST segment elevation in lead 1 and AVL. If we have mid to distal LED occlusion, there will be an ST segment elevation mainly in V4 and V5, which may extend to other left sided leads like V3, V6 and sometimes in to lead 2, ST segment depression occurs in AVR. If we have a non-dominant LCX, the ST segment uh, elevation usually is minimal if present in lead 2, 3, and AVF, with an ST segment depression mainly in V2 and V3, which may extend to V1 and V4. If we have a dominant LCX, the ST segment elevation occurs in lead 3 and AVF and may extend to lead 2. ST segment depression occurs in V1, V2, V3, and V4. Proximal RCA will give us ST segment elevation in leads 3, AVF, maybe lead 2, and uh, uh, right ventric ventricular infarction may be exhibited as V4, right V4 with an ST segment depression in leads from V1 to V3. Distal RCA occlusion usually will give us ST segment elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF with ST segment depression in V1, V2, and sometimes in V3. Now moving on to the final section of our lecture. In this segment, we will explore the practical application of the concepts we covered earlier. Our journey begins with the initial steps of assessment of calibration and patient information. First, we should check the, patient, the presence of patient information, and we may uh, use any uh, remarks or symptomatology uh, marked on the ECG. Second, we will look at the calibration mark and be sure of the, that the one millivolt cover uh, exactly the 10 the 10 vertical squares or maybe more or less according to the amplitude then we will check the calibration of the uh, recording speed which is very important to imply our standard measurement of time then we will check the rhythm and rate as we can see here at the bottom we have a rhythm strip which shows regular uh, QRS complexes. So we can imply the first method by uh, dividing 300 by the number of big squares between two consecutive uh, QRS complexes, giving us 75 beats per minute. If we apply the 1500 rule, we will count a 22 small squares between each consecutive uh, R waves giving us 68 beat per minute and also we can uh, uh, check the number of QRS complexes in six seconds which uh, are seven QRS complexes multiplied by 10 will give us 70 beat per minute so the ECG shows regular rhythm at 68 beat per minute next the P wave axis duration and amplitude here we can see that in lead 2, the P wave is upright and AVR, the, uh, the uh, P wave is inverted. 
that means that it has a right superior to left inferior axis which is the usual sinus axis here we have the p wave duration which is uh, 2.5 small squares that means it is 100 milliseconds um, which is uh, uh, less than uh, 120 milliseconds the maximum for the p wave and the p wave amplitude is 1.5 small square which is 0.15 millivolt which is less than uh, 0.25 millivolts the maximum for p wave amplitude thus the normal there is a normal p wave axis duration and amplitude next we will examine the relation between p and qrs and then measure pr interval here we can see that there is regular p waves which is followed by QRS complexes, each P wave is followed by a QRS, and there is a fixed relation between the P wave and the QRS. Next, we will measure the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. As we can see here, it spans five small squares, that means 200 milliseconds, which is a full PR. So the comment will be, every P wave is followed by a QRS, and uh, the PR is full. Then we will proceed for the QRS axis. Regarding the QRS axis, we will check the limb leads or the frontal limb leads. We can see here that lead 2 has the highest R wave amplitude and from the uh, this diagram the axis of the of lead 2 is plus 60 so the mean qrs frontal qrs axis is uh, plus 60 which is normal next we will check the qrs duration and qrs voltage we will select uh, the widest qrs which shows uh, two small square uh, means that it is 80 milliseconds which is less than 100 milliseconds meaning that the qrs duration is normal and we cannot uh, see uh, we cannot uh, identify any uh, socle line criteria for right ventricular or left ventricular hypertrophy that's why uh, the there is a normal qrs duration of 80 milliseconds and normal voltage Next is the T wave. Here we can see that the T wave is upright on all leads except AVR, which is normal. So the, the T wave axis is normal. Then we will check the QT interval. To check the QR interval, we have to measure uh, uh, two intervals. First, the actual QT interval from the beginning of the R wave to the end of the T wave, which is marked by the intersection between this tangential line intersecting the horizontal ECG baseline. Uh, by measuring this line, we can count nine small squares, meaning that 360 milliseconds or 0.36 seconds. Also, we have uh, to check the RR interval to, uh, to calculate the corrected QT. The RR interval spans two, two, 22 small squares, which means uh, 880 milliseconds, which is 0.88 seconds. By applying the Bazit formula, the corrected QT will be as following. 0.36 seconds divided by the square root of 0.88 second which will equal to 0.384 seconds which is less than 440 and more than 360 so we have a, a normal corrected qt interval at 384 milliseconds then we will check the st segment here we will identify the J point or the junctional point, the junction between the QRS and ST segment. We can see it is on the same horizontal line as the uh, as the TP segment. Also, the uh, ST segment lies at the same horizontal line as the TP segment, so there is no ST segment shaft. So the final comment will be. ECG shows regular sinus rhythm at 68 beat per minute, normal P wave axis, duration, and amplitude. 
Every P wave is followed by a QRS with full PR duration. Normal QRS axis of plus 60 degrees. Normal QRS duration of 80 milliseconds and normal voltage. Normal T wave axis. Normal QT interval of 360 milliseconds and normal corrected QT interval of 300. 84 milliseconds, no ST segment shift. In conclusion, the ECG has been in clinical use for over a century, while many other diagnostic modalities have lost their value and become obsolete, the ECG remains a vital tool, contributing significantly to saving millions of lives. Despite the presence of sophisticated and expensive technologies, I, as an electrophysiologist, continue to place my faith and trust in the time-tested ECG, investing time in improving ECG interpretation skill is a valuable endeavor for all of us. Thank you.